Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. I've really enjoyed listening to the presentations today, especially the opening panel on principles and values, because they were quite challenging. Uh, I think, though, that when we begin to talk about reproductive tourism, we also have to listen to what Alex had to say about organ transplants, because uh, there's a huge commercial aspect to it, which cannot be ignored. Um, I will begin by just uh, perhaps introducing you to the volume of uh, money that is made through medical tourism, and reproductive tourism falls under that category. Uh, in India, the estimate was that it would be about one to two billion, but now it has been raised to two billion upwards. The uh, other aspect, and I'm sorry I'm doing this, looking at the, which is what, why people have the uh, screen directly in front of them so that they don't have their backs at everybody else. But uh, it is uh, really began by people actually uh, going to India. Uh, these are the non-resident Indians because they did not have access to some of the uh, medical procedures. And that began a whole wave where the NHS actually began to compensate. They were able to claim money and get back into getting that. But since then, I think that there has been a huge uh, attempt to woo uh, the developed countries to come to countries like India, but India is not the only country now that does offers medical tourism. Many have been mentioned, such as Singapore and so on. But it's really uh, things like the joint ventures that have been started, which uh, such as insurance companies, where 51% of the stake could be held by the foreign company, which is not, was not the case, for example, in India before, where uh, we could not get uh, total ownership in that sense. And uh, it actually is the other part that has been quite important is that they're seeking international accreditation to make it possible for them to be uh, recognized as being uh, uh, credible in terms of the procedures that they offer. In many ways, uh, the cross-border uh, assisted human reproduction services are different because you're dealing with people who are otherwise healthy and uh, it is uh, really uh, much more a question of uh, being able to circumvent the uh, national laws which regulate uh, international, uh, the assisted human reproduction uh, so that procedures that would not be available to them can be used because either the country is not, uh, do not have regulations where the procedures are being conducted or that the people who provide them are quite willing to flaunt these uh, pr uh, without any impunity. Uh, there are many moral and ethical dilemmas that people have been speaking about, but perhaps the most important is that you now have close to uh, three million uh, children born of IVF alone, uh, apart from all the other assisted human reproductive services that are available. So there is a whole question of uh, what are their standing, what is it that they know, what kind of information do they have about uh, the, the, who their parents are, fathers, mothers, etc. Uh, I, I will not go into the range of services which are offered, but they're really quite uh, substantive. But IVF certainly is one of the major ones that is being offered uh, through reproductive tourism. And the other is surrogacy. Uh, the uh, se sex selection is one of the important reasons why uh, people go to a country like India to be able to have the child of the desired sex. Uh, the um, other, uh, but uh, interestingly enough, it is being offered in the US. 42% of the clinics actually offer sex selection through microsorting or through PGD uh, services. The um, surrogacy services are advertised openly in several countries. India, Russia, Ukraine, these are the countries where, which do that quite openly. And uh, there are different categories, that is you have the natural surrogate mother where the sperm from the putative father is provided, but the mother provides the egg. 
The others are the uh, full surrogacy, which is uh, where both the egg and the sperm are provided. And they have led to some really very uh, uh, challenging cases, particularly in India. There was one that recently about a Japanese father where the father and mother separated soon after the surrogate was hired. And uh, it led to some uh, really difficult time. The surrogate mother did not want the child, even though she had given birth to this child. Uh, and uh, under Indian law, the father could not claim the child. So it was quite, uh, it has led the Indian government to actually now uh, think about how they're going to regulate uh, surrogacy. One of them is to have the parents sign that they are actually permitted to have a, a surrogate child, but it hasn't reached very far as yet. The, um, I think that I would like to just move on because I feel that I'm running out of time here. But essentially, I just want to go on to talk about some of the recommendations, and that is that we really need, because it's a commercial aspect, that we really need to think about the, uh, how can commerce be regulated. And this is where I think GATS and uh, some of the international uh, um, laws that regulate trade need to be invoked, because that is essentially what is happening. Uh, I, I don't have any particular brilliant ideas about how one can do it. I have constantly talked about it, but I have no idea how that can be implemented. But I think that uh, this is something that we need to think about. And uh, a lot of people have talked about uh, the international legal framework that is needed to regulate, but it really is important to concentrate on uh, that women are not exploited in this whole process. The, um, some countries have moved forward on storage and disposal of uh, embryos, but I think that we really need to be much more uh, responsive to the issue of uh, re regulatory framework which apply not only internationally but are also implemented nationally because that is ultimately where the uh, procedures take place. And finally, I just want to say that we face a challenge of how to bring diverse and sometimes antagonistic stakeholders, this has been referred to by other people, together in order to be able to uh, act in the interest of uh, non-exploitative, safe non-exploitative services. Uh, and uh, then uh, that is true, it is also an opportunity to create uh, uh, and develop uh, proposals and policies that we can act on collectively. So the next two days, I think, promise us very much as to how we could move along some of these proposals. And I want to thank, uh, not thank, uh, <laughs> CGS for this wonderful initiative, and hopefully something really concrete will come out of it. Thank you.